What comes out of the person is what matters. And I really like that John 2, which says, in all things God desires that we prosper. If Christ truly, truly is the one who has your heart, mm -hmm. you must not only focus on, you know, externalities, mm -hmm. but especially about your heart and also about your health. Every time you're reading Jesus and his dealings, you need to understand he has an immediate audience, he has a secondary audience, and he has a big objective. When you always put those three things together, you're able to gain um, proper perspective. And unless we have our ears open to listening to the truth, we, we may be like people who have ears, but we are there. Does Christ's spirit dwell in you? Mm. Do you have the love of Jesus? And if yes, then how has it changed you? The Lord is saying that sometimes it's very possible that very subtly that we find ourselves getting deceived into a desire that in our service and communion for one another, we desire to exalt self. The religion of Christ is sincerity itself. Zeal for glo God's glory is the motive implanted by the Holy Spirit. And the only effectual working of the Spirit can implant this motive. Good morning and a happy Sabbath to you wherever you're joining us from. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to New Life SDA Church, 5th and Gong Avenue in Nairobi. And welcome to our camp meeting. Our camp meeting begins this year, another year that the Lord has brought us. And we are so thankful. So we are welcoming you to our camp meeting beginning today for the whole week. We will be here throughout the week. So please join us. We have classes for children, for teens, and for adults. Please join us from morning until evening. We will have programs for everybody. We welcome you yet again, and we'll be very, very glad to have you. So welcome to our Sabbath school this morning. This morning, our Sabbath school is teaching the disciples. Let's see what we're learning from today's lesson. But in the meantime, my name is Masi Odor, and I'd like to welcome my panelists to introduce themselves, and then we'll begin. Shall we start with you, Zef? Um, happy Sabbath. My name is Adar Zef, and I'm very happy to join you for this Sabbath school lesson. Thank Welcome. you. Happy Sabbath. My name is Seraphine Okemwa, and I'm delighted to have you uh, joining us as we discuss the Word of God. Welcome. And online, we've got our panelists as well. Shall we start with you, Saya? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Saya Jackson, and it's an honor to be with all of you. Amen. And Elder Chief? Uh, thank you very much. My name is Chief Andrew. I'm glad to be joining you for today's uh, session. Thank you. And Karibuni Sana, shall we begin with a word of prayer? Shall we pray? Our kind of loving Father, thank you for yet another Sabbath that we can come and discuss and, and, and learn from you from your word, O oh Lord. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God, who is our great teacher, will be our teacher first. You will teach us, even as we discuss your word, Lord, we will discuss with the knowledge and the power of your Holy Spirit. Speak to us this morning, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This morning, and this Sabbath morning, so we've come very, very closely to the middle of the book of Mark. We, when we began, we said that Mark has basically... Uh, uh, John Mark has divided this lesson, I mean, his, his book into almost two parts. One part that's looking at uh, Jesus demonstrating through his power, the power of miracles, to see who, the, who's, who is Jesus. So we get to know who is Jesus. And from the beginning, we're told, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now we're looking at what Jesus has done. We have demonstrated Jesus and his activities. But now we are slowly going towards the end to his mission. And what is his mission? So now we know who Jesus is and we know where he's going and he's going to the cross. And so today our lesson is looking at, you know, we're looking at halfway through the Mark, uh, Mark chapter 8. We will look at chapter 9 and chapter 10, a beginning of chapter 10. And this, this, uh, and this lesson has two parts. So this week we're looking at teaching the disciples part one and we will looking at teaching the disciples part two. As Jesus is, is, is preparing his disciples to understand his mission, 
and to see where he's going even as he prepares them to go to the cross. And so today we look at uh, the healing of, an, of two blind men. And it's very interesting that we will look at a blind man healed in a way that only the gospel of Mark records this particular story. And this story look, comes from the book of Mark chapter 8. And uh, I would request us to, to, to go there with us. Chapter 8 from verse 22. And if we're there, we will read together as we pick the lessons for the, for the day. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. And so he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And then he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on the eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone into the town. And this story is very interesting. Number one, we look at why two touches. But before we even get there, we see how Jesus, when this man is brought to him, and for me, what stood out for me in that, in that lesson is the fact that he was brought to Jesus. And my question is, how many of us remember to take along those in our lives to Jesus? Have you taken your friends to Jesus? Have you taken your family to Jesus so that they can get to meet Jesus, the great healer, or Jesus, the great teacher, or Jesus, the Savior. I wonder if my panelists, at any point, you have found yourself deliberately taking somebody to Jesus. I think the next lesson that I pick from this story is um, that Jesus, when he gets to Jesus, Jesus actually takes the man by the hand and leads him out of the town. Why would Jesus do that? Number one, the touch of Jesus. You can see compassion in when Jesus takes this man by the hand, but also Jesus takes him away from the crowd and from the eyes of those curious people who are waiting to see what does Jesus do with this blind man, possibly even away from his own friends who had brought him with, to Jesus, maybe so that this man can have a personal experience with Jesus himself. So I see Jesus leading this man, number one, to touch him, but also so that he can move him away from the crowds and have a one-to-one -one time with Jesus. I wonder if we are aware of the importance of having our one-to-one -one time with Jesus as this man does. But now we come to the heart of the matter. The first time that Jesus spits on him and touches his eyes and then he asks him, can you see? And the first time he, the man says that he sees men, but he sees them as trees. I wonder, for me, the lesson that I picked from there is that sometimes we need a second touch from the Lord to be able to see people clearly. The first time he could see people, and maybe in our salvation, as we start off and, and we're beginning to learn about the Lord. And spirituality sometimes does the insight of spirituality is gradual, that we slowly are beginning to understand the light and to, and to learn God slowly, that sometimes we need to be patient with others, Seraphim. You know, to be patient with others around us, even as we are teaching them the word of God, that we are patient with them, to realize that sometimes some people will learn slowly and they might need a second touch and even a third touch to be able to get to know the Lord that we are presenting to them. And so we see Jesus finally when he touches him and he's finally healed, he can see clearly. Maybe we do need a second touch. And then this, uh, the lesson then continues to see in seeing clearly. We then find a place where then Jesus moves on. And after he has left the blind man, he then moves on with his disciples. And as he's on the road, he asks them, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that Jesus is. When the men and women around you, who do they say your Jesus is? And when they came back, they say, verse 28 says, they answered John the Baptist, and some say Elijah's, and others say one of the prophets. There are many things that people will say who Jesus is. And in this case, but finally Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? You have spent time with me, so who do you say that I am? And Peter, knowing Peter, and we thank God for him, because he is a special character. He actually says, you are the Christ. And this is one time we see a man other than in all the, 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 the books, uh, the, the chapters of Mark that we've been looking at, most of the time the people who recognize who Jesus was were those possessed by demons. And this is one time now we see someone who's clarity and who has been with Jesus who actually says, you are the Christ. 
And I want to come to you, Zef, at this point, to actually ask, at this point we see the disciples are slowly beginning to openly declare who they actually know who Jesus is. And they, they declare he is the Christ, he is the Messiah. So if I could ask you, Zef, what has your knowledge of Jesus? What have you done with your knowledge of Jesus? Have you known Jesus? And what has your knowledge of Jesus, what have you doing with knowing that he is the Christ in your life? Uh, oh, thank you so much for that question, Masi. I think um, that question really is um, pivotal in my Christian life or having, when I'm a Christian, you know, Jesus is the center of everything. Mm. And understanding his identity in my life really is very critical because when we know who Jesus is, and we've seen this happening even with other religions disputing the identity of Christ. Mm -hmm. They say he was only but a prophet. Mm -hmm. But you know, Jesus himself said in, uh, uh, one time to, to his disciples that no one cometh to the Father mm -hmm. except by me. Mm -hmm. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. There is no any other path to God other than Jesus. Mm. And so when I pray, when I kneel down to pray, I remember uh, the words of John in First John chapter 2 from verse 1, which says, I write, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Mm. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, mm. but, but also for the whole world. So understanding the identity of Jesus in, in my life really is very critical. Because he is the one who will carry out my sins and the burden of my sins. He says in his word that come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. It is only through Jesus that we get, um, that, that we actually get salvation. Mm -hmm. So um, I even, sometimes I even wonder when I'm, when I'm thinking about this argument about Jesus being God and Jesus not be, just being a prophet mm -hmm. and things like that. And then I wonder, what, how do these people actually access God? Mm. Because there is no any other way apart from Jesus. You are actually literally locking away yourself from that path or from that light that will lead you to salvation. Amen. Let me come to you, Seraphim, because now they know who he is. They know Jesus is the Christ and the Messiah. But now he needs to explain to him, to them, that in following him, there is a cost to discipleship. What is that cost? Good question. What does Jesus teach about the cost of following him? The book of Mark chapter 8, 31 says, And he began to teach them mm -hmm. that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Mm. What is the cost of discipleship? I would want to tell us. To encourage and uh, expect hardness. To expect rejection. To expect challenges. To expect pain. To expect tears. Whether we are laboring for God in church or outside in the world. And the only way out of this pain is compromise. And so today you want to ask yourself, will you embrace the cross or put it aside? For you to be made a disciple, you must be willing to pay the cost. And the cost is the cross. Mm. So whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Christ says in the book of Matthew chapter 8 verse 38, of him shall the son of man be ashamed and he, when he cometh in the glory of his father and the holy angels. Jesus himself endured a lot in his ministry and he said he had to suffer mandatorily. He says he had to suffer mandatorily. The Bible says in Mark 8 verse 32 when he began to teach them that the son of man must do what? Must suffer. It was not 
It was not something he could avoid. For you and I to be saved, it was a must for him to suffer. And it was shocking that Peter, who just confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, takes him aside and rebukes him for saying he is going to suffer to save them. Ellen G. White in the book Desire of Ages for 15 says, Peter's words were not such as would be a help and a solace to Jesus in the great trial before him. They were not in harmony with God's purpose of grace towards a lost world, nor with the lesson of self-sacrifice that Jesus had come to teach by example. And so Jesus rebukes Satan, not because this Peter is one, but because he was using him to discourage Christ along that path. Mm -hmm. Followers of Christ are called to have the same goal as he did, to take the cross and follow him. You know, Peter asks, asks him, you know, what is this cost? And he answers them. He tells them, whosoever desires to come after me, mm -hmm. let him deny himself, take up his cross and do what? And follow me. You know, sometimes there's a sister of mine who used to tell me, me, I admire what you do. You are never seated on the pews. You know, being in church committees, being in, is a lot of work. And then I, I told her, it is a lot of work because you are here to go out there mm. and try it. Out, I actually always say, I'd rather be in a church committee. Yeah. I'd rather, because, I mean, it doesn't matter where you're serving God. New levels, somebody said, new devils. Mm. Just that the devils are different, but they are there. And that is actually the cross. Crucifixion was the most cruel, humiliating, and intimidating method of execution that the Romans had. But look, it was the way Christ chose. And I don't know what that means for you, my friend, for you, my sister, for you, my brother, who is serving God in a local church, who is serving God outside there, maybe in the middle of nowhere, mm. where there is no church, you who today has not made a decision to follow Jesus. What does the cross mean for you? I mean, the cost of discipleship, if it must be summarized in one word, it is the cross. Mm. And I'm reminded of a hymn writer. Today I join you, Jeff. I mean, yeah. Zeph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hymn number 328. One hymn writer wrote and asked, must Jesus bear the cross alone mm -hmm. and all the world go free? Mm -hmm. And then he answers and says, no, 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 no. There is a cross for everyone and there is a cross for me. And... To conclude it, I'm reminded the words of a hymn writer in hymn number 159, who cherishes the cross. And mm. he says, because of its value, I'll cherish the old ragged cross mm. till my trophies at last I lay down. And then he says, you know, I will not papasa papasa it. Mm. I will not have an on and off experience with the cross. I will cling to that cross mm. so that one day I exchange it. For a crown. Amen. May that be your experience. Amen. Amen, Seraphim. Let me come to you, Sire. Because John chapter 12, verse 25, the Bible says that he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternity. My question then is, have you experienced the reality of this word in your life? In terms of having to give up your life here that you may gain it in eternity. In a, in a micro sense, yes. <clears throat> um, so I remember when I was in high school at fourth form. Um, so that's a final year. And by, by that time, there's quite an investment that's been made into education. Mm -hmm. And in my case, um, given my background, which is very poor, um, education is and was seen as the key. But there was a change in school policy at that particular point that required us to begin attending classes on, on Sabbath. Um, all along, uh, form one, two, three, we would be okay. But now in fourth form, there's all that pressure for this is your exam year, you need to be there. And I remember there was a particular teacher who, um, because I'd miss the classes, would take um, the first couple of minutes 
on Monday morning to ridicule me in front mm. of the whole class, you know, and speak about how extreme my faith is oh. and um, how I'll not perform well and everything. And this came to a push until I was um, suspended. I was sent home. Mm. Now, if you, if you know anything about any average African father, um, <laughs> you need to add some levels higher to now know my father. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of being suspended from school was very terrifying. It, um, it's a declaration of war. So, so here I am um, being told and predicted that, hey, my faith will cost me good grades. Here I am, I have been sent home um, for the sake of my uh, faith. I arrived home, I'd expected the worst. I explained why I was there and my to my shock my parents understood and when i came back i i got a beating from the deputy and then got back to class um i still had to hold on to um the principles of the faith there was a lot more at stake i was a i was a school leader for the um adventist group at that point and so i got the sense if i buckled everyone else would buckle shortest version of the story is held on till the end, didn't um, sacrifice um, Sabbath keeping for, for, for grades. And when eventually we did KCSC, I did very well. Amen. And I distinctly remember the day I came to pick my results from school, none less than the very same deputy who would suspended me and given me a beating um, turned to me and told me, sir, that was very good performance. You performed mm. very well. And so down, fast forward down the road is because of the sacrifice of my cohort and myself mm. in choosing to keep the Sabbath and being faithful, um, bearing that kind of cross at that point, subsequent generations in my former high school were given the full-fledged permission to keep the Sabbath. Amen. So I'm happy that bearing the cross, it's when going through it, it's very scary, mm. but... Hebrews 12 comes to my mind, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, calling it shame, mm. and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. That's an experience that Amen. I thought Amen. Amen. And Amen. just to put it in context for people is that high school, they are basically 14 to 18 year olds. So that's pretty much a teenager making that decision for the Lord. May the Lord God bless you and keep you in the faith. Elder Chief, let me come to you. Because uh, we'll then move to Mark chapter 9, where we see a mountain time, a mountaintop experience. And this is what we yes. call the Mount, uh, Mount of Transfiguration. And uh, those of us who are in high school were doing CRE, this used to be very confusing to understand why Moses and Elijah. So maybe you could take us through and help the rest of us to understand. Thank you very much. Uh, why Moses and Elijah and the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. Now, I'll... Uh, one thing that I've seen uh, in, in, in the lesson when you capture it as teaching the disciples, it makes me see something that I hadn't seen before, especially on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you view it from the perspective of teaching, then I think you tend to see more. Uh, allow me almost to do like a recap of where you started. And... Uh, you remember the first man we just talked about? That first man was seeing men as trees. And, and for somebody who is blind to say he sees men as trees, either he was seen before, so he knows how men look like, he knows how trees look like, but he says, I'm not seeing clearly. Now, something interesting, he gets the second touch. He can now see clearly. Jesus says, do not tell anyone. So what is happening, Jesus doesn't want him to go into town and tell anyone. Why does Jesus get into this? He is the Messiah, and the common uh, theme or the popular interpretation of who the Messiah is, is likely to take a wrong picture, the political uh, redeemer, rather than what Jesus would want it to be. But you see, this almost gets to the point where Jesus feels like, I think I'm being mistaken. He asks the question, who do men say that I am? And the, the answer comes. So here is really trying to unpackage who the Messiah is. And we see um, the answer is given as my sister just shared. And then uh, he still realizes this man not getting it clearly. 
Because Peter, who has already admitted that he's the Messiah, is trying to prevent him. So when we get to, when we get to chapter 9, verse 1, he begins by saying, because you see he has already said that when he cometh with the glory of all his holy angels, so for you to understand the transfiguration, actually you need to end chapter 8. So in Mark 8, 38, it says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall also the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his angel, or of his Father with, all, with the holy angels. So the perspective is Jesus is talking about that glory. And what time is Jesus going to have that glory? Now, he says this, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that some of them that stand here shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. So this is what he is going to explain. So when you get to um, Mark chapter 9, you must have the context that there were people who now started saying that some of the disciples are not going to die until the time of the second coming. So in Mark chapter 9 verse 2 it says, After six days, from those events, the Messiah's story and everything, after six days, remember the story of the second touch. It's like God wants to give them a second touch. God wants to give them a clearer understanding of who the Messiah is. Because these people had asked, they had an idea of the Messiah. In fact, they even said that you are the Messiah. Now Jesus seeking to give them a clearer picture the Bible says, He taketh with him Peter, James, and John, leads them to the high mountain apart from themselves. He was transfigured before them. Now, in the transfiguration, Jesus takes a glorious form. Moses appears and Elijah appears. And, 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 and when you have these two appearing, I like the way you alluded to CRE, and, and, and people will say, Why did Moses appear to represent the law? Why did uh, Elijah appear to represent the prophets? And, and, and then you get to understand that there could be a misconception here if Moses appears to represent the law and Elijah to represent the prophets. Because if that would be the interpretation, then you'd ask yourself, uh, were there other prophets? Significantly, in terms of the law, is Moses actually the one representing the law? And, and this would get us to a problem with uh, the, the laws that Moses was to write and such. So I, I clearly look into this with a view that we are already talking of some will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power, will make us understand these two figures that appear here, Moses and Elijah, appear giving a microcosm of the second coming. So Moses appears to represent those who have faith in the Lord, they will die, but they will be resurrected. Now, we have Elijah appearing, representing those who will not die and will be translated. For we know that Moses, uh, Elijah was translated, went to heaven. Moses, we also know the story of Moses when uh, he died. And this you can find in the book of Jude. When you read the book of Jude, and uh, this is clearly illustrated of the resurrection of Moses. Now, this story doesn't end at this point in time. We find that uh, another question is asked, and, and we are still talking about the Messiah. And, and as we are still talking about the Messiah, I, I, I just wanted to, to just share something. You see, the disciples have had an experience of Jesus at his best. In fact, uh, the mountaintop experience is, uh, is close to what we normally refer to as on the day of baptism. Almost everyone will say their best experience was on that day of baptism when they gave their life and, and they were feeling like they should just go to heaven. Now the mountaintop experience gets to a point where the disciples feel like, why don't we just stay here? Why don't we make a tabernacle for, and, and, and just come here and dwell with Moses and Elijah? But, but, but look at it. The Messiah is for the salvation of the world. He should go to the world. You, you, you don't stay at the mountaintop. And, and, and this is also with us. 
when, when, when God gives you spiritual insight, when God give, gives you a clearer explanation of who he is, when, when he gives you that second touch and you are able to see things clearer, he doesn't want you to stay at the mountain with it. He wants you to come and share this. Now look, from the mountaintop, in uh, Mark chapter 9 verse 14, when the disciples, when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude, the scribes questioning. They were greatly amazed. In verse 17 says, one of the multitudes answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, wheresoever the dumb spirit hath stoned this person. And then the Bible says, I speak to thy disciples, they could not cast him out. So from a mountaintop experience to a terrifying situation. And in fact, I'll, I'll read something from Desire of Ages. It says uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the book Desire of Ages, uh, this is the story of the ministry of Jesus, chapter 47. It says, in a brief space of time, the favored disciples have beheld the extreme glory and of humiliation. The extreme of glory and of humiliation. They have seen humanity as transfigured in the image of God and as debased in the likeness of Satan. And, and, and that is why when you come to the story, the Bible says, uh, Jesus says, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer? Bring the person unto me. They brought him. When he saw the spirit tear him and he fell to the ground and wallowed forming, he asked the father, how long has this happened? He said, since a child. And then the Bible says this. Jesus answered and said, if you can believe, all things are possible. And then the man says, the father cried and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And, and, and you see, the, the, I, I'm almost thinking like the disciples were having a problem with belief. They were having a problem understanding the Messiah. Christ gives them, yes, the mountaintop experience, second touch. And when you come down here, Christ is talking of help thou my unbelief. For me, the teachings are coming in a package that even when you look at the cost of discipleship, at times we look at the cost of discipleship, the suffering, and we tend to get to a point of failing to believe. And it would be good that our unbelief is helped. Thank you. Oh, that is so powerful, Elder Chief. Um, quite a summary right there. And I'd like to come to you, Zef, to just ask in terms of, you know, when you, when you hear this father crying out, I believe help my unbelief. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you know you believe that Jesus is able, but you're struggling. Your faith is struggling. I don't know. Uh, several times because, you know, in this world we are surrounded by so much darkness. Mm. We are surrounded by sin. And, and the way we live our daily lives and the experience we have, even with our neighbors and the people we interact with, they tend to make us not to believe in God. Mm. You know, some, some of the questions you can have, uh, some, some of your colleagues maybe in, at work ask you is that, hey, you know, this money is here. Why don't you just split it amongst ourselves? And you know that is corruption and you don't want to engage in that. And somehow I see uh, that kind of um, temptation or the, the idea that I should not absolutely believe in what I, I, I believe in, in my, in my Christian values, keeps playing out, mm -hmm. keeps playing out when I interact with other people, like neighbors or people who are not even of the faith. Mm -hmm. And even when I'm alone and I'm, 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 I'm cumbered with a lot of uh, uh, trouble, like if, I, if, if you lose a loved one, you get to a point where you ask yourself, why so much pain, you know? And sometimes you just need to look at the face of Jesus and everything around you will become dim, you know? And, 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 and you will learn to trust in God. And, and once you give yourself or you give your heart to God, 
you will learn to know that now it is not about you. It is now about him and what he can do in you so that you can receive of the blessings of him. Yeah. Amen. I don't know if, Seraphim, you've had this experience. You know, we are in the camp meeting week, and you know, part of um, camp meeting is high Sabbath. And camp meeting is an amazing experience. It's a, it's a mountaintop experience. But like, just like Elder Shifa has said, there will come a time when the mountaintop has to come down. So we have to do the spiritual high for one week. But we have to come down, go back to our jobs, to our lives. And I wonder how you balance that. And sometimes what seems like the disappointment of the, of the plains when we finally come down from the mountaintop. Sometimes coming down from the mountaintop can feel completely... Um, crushing, especially because you don't know how to handle yourself and manage yourself after the mountaintop experience. But um, I'm called to ponder on what is true greatness. Mm. What is true greatness as, as a Christian? Because the biblical idea of God greatness vis-a-vis -vis the worldly idea of um, greatness is completely different. Mm. When we look at the world, the world views greatness as how much you have in a bank account. The world views greatness, even here in church, as how, my, how many people can you draw to yourself in terms of popularity, in terms of fame, in terms of, you know, how many people can look up to you. But the word of God is clear that true greatness consists in humility. I actually love a quote by Ellen G. White in, a, in the book um, um, Fundamentals of True Education, where she says, true greatness is true goodness. She says, the fear of the Lord lies at the foundation of all true greatness. Integrity and swerving integrity is the principle that you need to carry with you into the relations of life. True greatness is true goodness. And for me, show me a great person, and I will show you a good person. Amen. And that brings me very, very seamlessly to you, uh, Zef. Because we see, as, as Seraphim is saying, we see the disciples now struggling to discuss who is great among them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you could take us through uh, Mark chapter 9 to just look at what does Jesus tell them about who, what is true greatness, even as we reference to what Seraphim was talking about. Okay, um, from the deductions that I have had in the lesson, just to summarize, was that, you know, they were actually after the meeting that they had with Jesus and now they were moving from north now to south, um, that is uh, Capernaum, and Jesus was slightly ahead of them. And somehow they were discussing around, uh, the, amongst themselves, about who is greater amongst them. And um, this story, really, what it brings out, I, as human beings, I think because th th there's a reason why Jesus said we are of our father, the devil. You know, we really want to exalt ourselves and be greater than others. You know, and, and this is what also led to the fall of Lucifer, you know. And, and, and his works we will do, he says, he continues to say, you are of the father of the devil and his works will you do. And I think this is, um, is, a, is, a, is an inborn, um, now that we are sinners, is an inborn ability, uh, I mean, it's a tendency, it's an inborn tendency to, to just want to be great amongst others and um, as we were beginning you know we were ch chatting on what olympics stands for and you know you know greatness comes with being better than others mm -hmm. but somehow christ um twists that thought mm -hmm. and and it gives us uh, uh, uh what greatness really means mm -hmm. that if you want to be a great then you must become a servant mm -hmm. You must be able to accept even the little ones like children. Why, why would he bring children in the picture? I see a child being very honest. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see, when you see a very young child and, 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 and some of the way they behave before they're exposed to sin, you know, they're very honest. They want to be very innocent. Mm -hmm. And 
they are very vulnerable in their state. They don't show any form of greatness. So if you are able to accept one of these um, uh, children, like th these young people, like children, then you will become great. But not the greatness that we think about as human beings, but you'll become great in the eyes of God. In, sh in short, Jesus is trying to say, that the attention he has given every human being on earth mm -hmm. is the attention he would have with, e with every other human being as if there was no any other human being. You know, the attention Christ has given you is a maximum attention. You don't need to be great or you don't need to be extraordinary by your own self. Mm -hmm. But Christ has already viewed you as one of his and you are great already. Um, co continuing on uh, with, uh, with, 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 with that statement, actually uh, from uh, Mark chapter 9 from verse 30, I'll just read the excerpt quickly. It says, then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and, it and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying, and were afraid to ask him. I see disciples actually struggling from who is great. Now they're even struggling to who is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Now they're even struggling to what will happen. And Jesus is trying to, um, let me say, he's trying to give them uh, words little by little. He's trying to um, open their eyes little by little, like what he did to the blind man. You know, the first time he touched the blind man, he was seeing trees. But after that, when he touched him the second time, the vision became clearer and clearer. And this concept is still playing out here because we know that he had talked about um, himself being crucified and, and rising up the third day. And now, He's talking about being betrayed. No, it's something else that he had not said earlier on. And, 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 and he's introducing these truths to, this, to, to his disciples little by little so that they can have an understanding of, of who he is. Why would he, why would he do this? You know, um, at that time in that society, um, someone calling you a messiah would actually mean something different. It would not mean dying on the cross and you know, dying on the cross is such a shameful death. And if the disciples would have known that actually Jesus would, came to just die on the cross naked, I'm not sure if they would have wanted to be the, his followers. And so because he first taught them and tried to open their eyes so that they could see the truth, then they accepted the truth that he would actually die on the cross. And this is still playing out um, um, uh, even with parables as we had read earlier. You know, Jesus wanting to give us truths in the simplest ways so that it gets to fertile ground and bears seed at the end of the day. It just doesn't fall on rocks so that birds, uh, chirping birds will uh, uh, just uh, eat them off. But truth that will actually get to fertile ground. And I see him preparing the hearts of his disciples for what will happen. And I know even right now, um, reading from uh, news and what is happening, you'd hear of um, uh, countries uh, where now they say Jesus came from, really still waiting for the Messiah. Messiah. Mm -hmm. their, their, their thoughts about Messiah is that he's someone who is supposed to help them politically and become probably a president and make them the greatest nation. Again, the question of being great comes out here. Mm -hmm. Make them the great nation and be, uh, you know, just be a special people apart from the world. But we read through his word that he, that of course all of us belong to him. We are a people of his pasture and he, we are all important to him and there is no one who is greater than the, than the other. And uh, if you read on, you will see disciples meeting someone um, uh, that is, I think, from, from uh, verse 38 to 39, all the way to 40, meeting someone who was healing uh, other people, performing miracles, sorry, in the name of, like, you, they did not know him, and now they are wondering, well, how is he that is performing miracles? 
And the answer that Jesus gave was quite interesting. That, you know, he recognized that person. He should have said, no, yeah, you know, you, you need to stop him. Like the way we as Adventists, we do. You know, if you, we always think and know that we actually bear the truth and no one else is doing right out there. But here we also see a lesson of that Jesus also recognizes good acts that are being done by other people who are not of this faith. Yeah, so this is some of the lessons that I draw from the Wednesday part, who is the greatest. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And just, just to put it into perspective, this that the highest place is a place of service in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is looking, and, and when he's teaching using a child, and he's telling them, if, if, you, if, you, you know, if you receive me, as you receive this child, because he was trying to show that at that point in that community, children and women were not considered as much. But Jesus is saying, if you consider even the lowest among my own, then you receive me. And not only do you receive me, but you receive he who sent me, who is the father. Sire, let me come to you. Because now we see a very interesting topic talking about a healthy man in hell. And we would like to look at that from Mark chapter 9, uh, chapter 9 from verse 42. Just take us through who is this healthy man who arrives in hell and how does that work out? Thanks, thanks Marcy, for that. So how to dissect this story is two ways. Lane number one is if you want to know how the road ahead or the destination ahead is or looks like, the best thing to do is ask somebody who's either arrived or who is coming back from there. So how does this apply? Jesus has come from heaven and he is on earth explaining to the people here. And in Mark 9, 42 uh, in, in, in to, through to 50, what he's doing there is he's showing them how important um, how he values um, eternity and how he thinks of people who block others from getting to um, eternity. So he, he makes a statement and says, if anyone makes any of these little ones who have believed in me to stumble, it would be better for them that a milling stone was tied around their neck and they're thrown into the, into the deep. So in other words, Christ is saying for him, Heaven is so precious. Redemption of the soul is so important that any individual blocking or making the people who would otherwise believe in him to stumble, he'd be like, just get rid of them. Like it's, 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 it's um, emphasis by contrast. That's what he's doing. So in the first lane of things, Christ is showing us that what lies ahead in terms of redemption and heaven is so important is so so important that he does not take lightly individuals who block the pathway to people getting there and then secondly the second stream of thought is um, this is normally asked in sports circles which is how badly do you want this thing um, Paul would later on say um, athletes who want to achieve a, a crown that passes away put their bodies to such extreme discipline to make sure that they can get that um, laurel wreath which will eventually fade away and so to bring that point home similar point home Jesus will then invest time in verses 43 all the way through to verse 50 of Mark chapter 9 um, through again hyperbole and humor um, to show what he means he says hey if your right eye is a thing that is causing you to miss this beautiful thing called eternity you better get rid of it he says if you hand causes you to see and chop it off if your leg causes you to see and hey cut it off now it's very clear that jesus who respects the old testament is not promoting mutilation mm -hmm. um some a feature that is clearly condemned in in deuteronomy jews were not meant to mutilate themselves but what he's showing here is the sort of posture or attitude that one needs to be that eternity is so precious, eternity is so important, that anything that would hinder the individual from acquiring it, it is worth to sacrifice it now. Why we know this is hyperbole language is because it is the individual without an eye 
who is in heaven. It's the individual without an arm who's in heaven, while the individuals who are ostensibly whole, who've not made the sacrifice to lose limb or, um, or, or liberty or eye, who are in hell. So, in other words, Christ is asking, what shall it benefit you to keep everything and eventually be, be perish? Um, one writer puts it beautifully, says he is no fool who loses that which he cannot keep mm -hmm. so that he will gain that which he cannot lose. And I like subsequently how Ellen White would put um, in this beautiful words, she says, if there is a victory to be won, there's a battle to be fought. Mm -hmm. And we will soon realize that the flesh fights against the spirit mm -hmm. and the spirit fights against the flesh. And who wins depends on who mm -hmm. we feed. So what Christ is teaching us in uh, Mark 9 is not a theology of mutilation, but it's a theology of telling us the ultimate price to be gotten is so precious, it's so important that um, there, but there are two forces fighting within us. Those that are represented by the flesh, the, the eye, the arm, the hand, those are the forces of the flesh that mm -hmm. tend to take us away from eternity. And those who succumb to those will go into distraction, being entire and being whole. But those who put to the discipline, their eyes, their hands, their um, every bit of their flesh is put under the discipline that through the power of the Holy Spirit will be able to go, quote unquote, lame and mime and, and, and blind, but they'll be able to inherit eternal life. Just one more quick thing. Christ is not teaching about an eternal hell. Mm. Just the same way that this is being taught within the context of hyperbole. What he's speaking about is hell is the sinner is destroyed forever it's not perpetual um, destruction it is eternal destruction but the key point he wants us to realize is for us to be able to gain eternity there's going to be a sacrifice but at the end of the day it's better you enter heaven with sacrifice mm. than remain whole intact and healthy and willing to sacrifice and end up sacrificing and ruining your eternal destiny Amen. And thank you so much. I'd like you all to prepare your closing remarks. And we'll look at um, the summary for Friday says that before honor, this is a quote from The Desire of Ages, page 436, that before honor is humility. To fill a place before men, heaven chooses the workers who, like John the Baptist, take a lowly place before God. The most childlike disciple is the most efficient in labor for God. The heavenly intelligence can cooperate with him who is seeking not to exalt self, but to save souls. Beloved of God, I wonder if when the Lord looks at us, he sees people who in whatever service we are serving him at, that we seek for the salvation of soul as opposed to exaltation of ourselves. By all that has given us advantage over others, be it education and refinement, nobility of character, Christian training, religious experience, we are in debt to those less favored. And so far as lies in our power, we are to minister unto them. So you who's gotten some extra education, you who has known the truth of Jesus Christ, you have known the truth of this faith that we profess, the Lord requires of you to feel indebted to those who are less favored. And that is why we must leave our comfort zones, brothers and sisters, and go for mission to the unriched. Because it shall be held against us that we had all this in our favor and did not do to others. For, for who we had been given much, much was expected of us. May the Lord bless us. Your closing remarks, my dear panelists, as we come to the end of this Sabbath morning. Shall we start with you, Zef? Okay. Um, thank you. I think uh, what strikes me uh, throughout the lesson is the kind of life uh, Christ lived, especially on the question about the mountaintop experience and also um, down on the plain experience. I want to read a quote uh, from the book Prayer, uh, to, uh, page number 286, paragraph 2. It says, God does not mean that any of us should become hermits or monks and retire from the world in order to devote ourselves to acts of worship. The life must be Christ's life between the mountain and the multitude. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray, or his prayers will become a formal routine. 
when men take themselves out of social life, away from sphere of Christian duty and cross-bearing, when they cease to work earnestly for the master who, work, who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. They cannot pray in regard to the wants of humanity and their upbuilding of Christ's king kingdom, pleading for the strength wherewith we work. Here in this quote, we are told that our, our lives need to be between the mountain and the multitude. Having an experience with God and teaching others, they must go hand in hand because if we do not balance these two, we will lose one at some point. We will either lose teaching others the whole Christian experience will become null and void. There is a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There is a mercy with the Savior, which is more than liberty. Verse uh, 4, it says, But if our life were but more simple, we should take him at his word, and our lives will be all sunshine in the sweetness of our Lord. Amen. Let's take him at his word. Amen. To the death of Christ, we owe everything thing in this earthly life. The bread we eat, the spring of water we partake of, all of them have the cross of Calvary stamped on them. Think about all these good things you enjoy as being the tokens of the cross. Mm. But can you imagine taking all these things given by God out of sacrifice and eternally committing them to the devil? What a theft. Mm. And that is the essence of a healthy man in hell. My question to you, my friend, is who is seated on the throne of your heart? Amen. Elder Chief? Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, as, as we close, um, just quick, two things quickly. One, um, the emphasis cannot be made on uh, how serious sin is especially when God has to get to the point of saying, I'd rather even have you with, uh, with missing body parts, but just come to heaven. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you see, that's an extreme that he pushes to. He says, uh, look, if they're going to chop off your neck, because persecution is coming, it goes to the extreme. He says, don't fear that. Just do anything so that you're able to come to heaven. Because I, I take sin seriously. If, I, I will not look at how healthy you are. Uh, and, and, and one thing that comes in, that, that doesn't mean we don't need to be healthy. We need to be healthy. But he's saying, please, don't focus on the minors. At times we decorate the outside when the inside is not uh, really properly done. And he says, I want you to focus on the inside so that this outside, the imperfections of the outside, we shall be regenerated. So he says, don't worry, I'm going to work on that. And, and at, at times, it's almost like God saying, don't make yourself so beautiful to go to hell. You can be the prettiest person in hell, but you are in hell. But it, it doesn't mind whether you're the ugliest person. The glorified body may be much better. But the last part that I want to finish with is on the mountaintop, something happened. When we get to the mountaintop uh, experience, God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Could we allow ourselves that each of us who has come into contact with God at the mountain, that God can confidently say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. That when we come from the mountaintop experience, we can go down to the plains and people can listen to us because we have spent time with the Lord. May God bless us. Amen. Sire. My list to encourage us and remind us that when the whole the words of the hymn that says, sing the wondrous love of Jesus in his goodness and his praise, in the chorus it says, just one glimpse of him in glory mm. will all the, the, all the toils of life repay. God does not call us to sacrifice, mm. save that which he knows would otherwise be a hindrance mm. to our walk with him. 
when we will be able to stand finally in eternity and look back at the eyes he asked us to pluck off and the limbs he asked us to chop off and the sin he asked us to put aside, we will then realize two important things. One, it was worth it. Amen. And two, that ultimately heaven was actually very, very affordable and every bit worth it. Amen and amen. As we come to the end of our Sabbath school this morning, we are told in Desires of Ages that angels are ever present where they are most needed. And with those who have the hardest battle with self to fight and whose surroundings are the most discouraging. The angels surround you, my brother and sister, in this your struggle of life. In this your walk with the Lord where we, are, we have the hardest battle to fight and sometimes discouraging circumstances. The angels of God are ever present to strengthen and to encourage. If, the, if God in heaven could send Elijah and Moses to encourage Jesus even as he came to the path towards his death, how about us? The Lord is sending us all the help that we need to walk this path to heaven. We've come to the end of our Sabbath school this morning. I, again, I remind you to join our, our camp meeting this week. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless your families. And I will ask our brother Sire to pray for us as we finish our lesson. Eternal Father, we thank you profoundly for everything you have been to us. We thank you because you are a God who teaches us through our personal experience and through the experiences of others. We pray that, Lord, where we need a second touch like you did to that blind person so that we see well and understand well, we will do so. We pray that, loving Father, where we need to strengthen our mountaintop experience and lose sight of I'm clamoring for being the greatest, the loving God, you will help us find you. We pray that, Lord, you will reveal the um, proverbial limbs we may need to lose and the eyes we may need to forfeit and the sin we need to put aside so that we will have you in our lives and be able to have the victory we need. We pray that, loving God, you will give us that much essential victory over sin, over the flesh, over the devil, and over the world. But importantly, you may give us that revelation that you did to Peter that you indeed are the Son of God, and that we will believe this wholeheartedly and live our lives like we believe that. Keep us in the week ahead. Bless us and ever draw us to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.